tips. We usually get started a couple minutes after the start of the hour as people trickle in. Uh, today's a bit of a, um, a low-key call with our open agendas. Um, yeah. I don't know if anyone has any hot, hot burning topics uh, they want to talk about. I've got a few, a few conversation starters on here if anyone doesn't have anything, but uh, we also can just uh, adjourn so people can have some more time back in their afternoons as well. I don't think Corey's going to today. Yeah. And I'm trying to add people as they come on um, on the attendance, but this is sort of an open open note taking, open attendance. Uh, if folks could help out with that, it'd be appreciated. It gets harder to do as the meeting goes on. Our last call was was um, was more focused on software uh, and how we're you know we're using that allows us to use the infrastructure and move things between the infrastructure. Um, but it was it had some some really useful content. Um, this call, like most of our calls, uh, are, are recorded. Um, and we have the, the links on the agenda doc. Um, at the top of the agenda doc is also a link to the YouTube playlist. Um, so you can sort of get to the, the ongoing uh, recordings from the meetings. Um, uh, I think we've had one meeting uh, this year that wasn't recorded um, in the, just because of the topic trying to, uh, uh, security confessions, trying to, to elicit uh, um, uh, more conversation. Um, and we don't also, uh, it's difficulty, we usually have difficulties um, with our in-person meeting at DigiPrez. Um, it's harder to broadcast and to record those as well, but everything else is up there. Um, so as we, as we wait a couple more minutes for, um, for folks to, to join the call, um, did anyone have anything they wanted to talk about today? Was there anything um, on the call um, or, or anything on on your minds or in at facing your your organizations related to, to infrastructure uh, that you wanted to ask the community or discuss with the community about. Thanks. Well, I'm curious if um, if anyone, if your organization uses any sort of collaborative infrastructure, um, whether that's something um, that you uh, have some sort of co-located hardware with another organization, um, if you actually, uh, if that could be, you know, you're, you're renting space somewhere together or do you actually have a data center together Maybe it's some sort of reciprocal arrangement. You know, you host a rack in our center, and you, and you, um, uh, and likewise, you'll host a, one of our racks in, in your center. Um, is there, you know, does anyone have any sort of um, collaborative infrastructure type of arrangement um, that helps you um, do digital preservation in your organizations? Uh, well, in Spain, uh, now everybody is starting to look for solutions for digital preservation for research data. And uh, for example, there is the consortia of universities in Catalonia, and they are trying to look for a collaborative solution 
and all the universities in that region in Spain coming together to find uh, which is the best solution because they are suspecting this uh, digital preservation and repositories for data research uh, is not a um, cheap solution. It, everything points that uh, this, the, those solutions will be expensive, so they are joining together to be able to, to confront this new challenge. So are they looking for an entire, an entire um, digital preservation solution uh, kit, so to speak, or just sort of the, the underlying infrastructure or, or anything that will help solve the answer? Well, I think now they are studying the matter and uh, everything is, they are just learning. Uh, for example, uh, I can say that the CERN the, um, in Europe, uh, there is a project they are also looking how to store all the data created by this uh, collision. I don't know how to say in English the CERN. Do you know this this international project uh, where they collect data about uh, subatomic particles just uh, collisioning? The amount of data is very huge, so they are looking uh, also for solutions to to uh, preserve. Uh, correctly this data and not only preserve but being able to use this data in the future so um, I think it's a moment everyone is looking for good solutions and uh, making research how are we going to front this challenge not only at a uh, Spanish level but they are looking for infrastructure a new software solutions it's like uh, a new world to discover Maybe people is thinking about it for a long time, but now is the moment to confront it. And I see in Europe, uh, great institutions are uh, trying to investigate, research, find good solutions for that in, at all levels. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, that's... Uh, um... Some of that, that's certainly got some big, big data coming off from, um, uh, well, big data sets coming off from uh, some of those particle accelerators for sure. Yes, what I know is that um, the European Union, together with some uh, four big enterprises, they um, are looking out for companies to develop one, a good infrastructure software system, and they calculate that the uh, investment they should do only in research, the, uh, they are trying to find companies who will uh, meet some requirements. The company who will win will get about $3 million only for research. So there, I think there is uh, now a lot of interest in developing these systems specifically for research data. So this is what, what I, can, I can say about uh, Europe now. Hmm. That's a pretty broad uh, sort of uh, collaborative shared infrastructure. Uh, Two million, that's a pretty, uh, pretty big budget uh, under the European Union umbrella. Um, is there any, anyone have any, um, anything a little smaller? I think thinking of, you know, I'd like to do some collaborative infrastructure, but um, whew, that's pretty big. <laughs> um, um, in Georgia, we're kind of in early stages looking at maybe swapping um, infrastructure types with a couple folks. So at University of Georgia, all of our infrastructure is local. And then there's another institution we're talking to where all of their infrastructure is off, you know, AWS out in the cloud. And so we'd like to get some stuff outside of our city. And they'd like to get some stuff where they actually know where it is for sure. And so we're just looking at you know, they can put some of the stuff in our infrastructure and we'll put some of the, our, our stuff in theirs. Um, the biggest challenge so far, um, besides getting everybody feel comfortable that it's like, you know, we're not going to suddenly get overwhelmed with too much stuff from someone else, is just the, the sheer practicality of how do you transfer this stuff. Is, um, are you located 
near each other at, at, at uh, is it another Georgia organization? It was another is it... Georgia organization. Yeah, they're in Atlanta. So we're looking at me hopefully getting like a secure network connection so they can just transfer it, you know, without having to send, you know, hard drives or LTO tapes back and forth. And I would assume that's for sort of ongoing transfers, not like an initial migration or an yeah, initial, the initial one might need to, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's a lot of stuff might need to be off medium and then after that you know doing it over a network if we can so is it mostly storage or, or is it other types of infrastructure that you might um be trying to use um from each other's uh, it would be pretty much storage so you know a monitor you know something that's monitored you know for changes and that kind of thing but sort of just your basic sort of preservation storage um, to get diversity in our infrastructure that neither of us can do on our own. And where does that fit into your, um, your sort of preservation planning? Is this sort of a, uh, uh, an initial tier or sort of like a top tier or somewhere in between as far as, um, you know, where, how far you'll go um, to protect the bits, so to speak? Sure. I think it would be um, for, for our most important content. Um, so everything has sort of a baseline preservation in our respective infrastructures. And then for the kind of top tier stuff, we want to get a little more diversity than what we have. Okay. Um, in case what we have sort of fails on us or, you know, there are risks in each case that our infrastructure don't account for very well. Um, in our case, you know, for natural disasters and in their case for not having local control. So we're not that far along yet, so I don't feel like I can say who it is that we're talking to, but um, that's what we're thinking about. Sure, sure. Thank you. Eduardo, I think you've presented on um, risk management and digital preservation before. Um, I think I heard about a presentation you gave at PASIG. Um, do you know, is that um, uh, what you just talked about in terms of uh, the um, effort in Spain uh, to, to find a collaborative solution for digital preservation infrastructure um, or the EU efforts for, for infrastructure for research data. Um, is, is that really just sort of looking at, um, you know, we just need infrastructure writ large to, to house this data, to process this data, um, or is part of that really thinking about the preservation and, and mitigating the, the risk, um, the risk side of that too? Or is it really just sort of the basics we, we need to house and store it and, and process and analyze? Um, well, what uh, we detected is uh, that with the NDSA levels of digital preservations, there were some inherent risks in uh, the digital preservation systems we have now that uh, were, could not be detected, Espe specifically human factors and organizational factors. This is uh, a problem that for a long time has been uh, relevant in aviation. Uh, and I reached uh, to this point because I'm uh, an airline transport pilot myself. So I could compare the safety management systems we use in aviation with the um, digital preservation standards that I, and then we found some cases where some problems uh, uh, could uh, be detected if we could enrich the levels of digital preservation with some solution that had, had been already tested in aviation. So our goal now is to develop uh, a specific implementation of safety management system of aviation to the field of digital preservation and to see how uh, this could fit in the actual levels, how to improve these uh, NDSA levels to take into account these organizational factors and the human factor. That th this is the the project where we are working now 
and uh, we hope to present in the, into the future the results of this research. Well, we look forward to hearing more on that. Yeah, thank you. I hope soon. <laughs> Any, uh, anyone else who's using any sort of collaborative or shared infrastructure and at their organizations or one that they, with, that they work with? Uh, well, uh, in our case, the University of Balearic Islands has started to give support to the historic archives of our villages that in some cases uh, have documentation of the 14th century. So what we are doing is to digitize uh, these uh, old documents, but then we are offering our university infrastructure in order to uh, uh, give the digital preservation solution to all these small uh, institutions that uh, are in, uh, in our area. And it's interesting because we are giving support to many interesting archives that has not the economical resources to do it by themselves and uh, this collaboration they give us access to very old uh, historic information that we can use and we offer them the platform the technological solution to to preserve the results so this combination is working uh, very well for us Are these um, indigenous uh, peoples or, or sort of historical uh, villages, long, long, um, long settled areas? Um, well, in uh, our island, the villages are, most of them has more than 10 centuries of story, history, and they keep all the government records, um, uh, administrative transition for many, from many centuries. And it's common that each small village has his, his own uh, archive that uh, is part of the government, of the small government of the village. And uh, I don't know if I, I'm answering your question. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, I was just trying to get a, a sense, I guess, of um, if these, um, that these resources weren't really, were available before. Um, and uh, a sense of if the uh, communities were, um, if, if they had the records, um, if they had the digital copies, you know, could they make them available digitally? Yes. Um, uh, well, a good example, for example, is uh, we have digitized some uh, maps uh, where they represent the properties. Who is the owner of this uh, of this property. Mo most of these original maps are from the 18th century, but when there is some uh, dispute or some problem that between, for example, two neighbors arguing who is the owner of this uh, part of the land, usually uh, the court asks for the original documents from the 18th century. Uh, uh, many people were consulting these documents, so there, were, there was a clear risk uh, of the, uh, these original documents were damaged. So when we digitize them and preserve them, then uh, no need to access the original one. So the court can access the digital copy. So in fact, uh, these processes uh, give more visibility to, the, uh, to one documentation that in fact is very important. We are finding cases like, like that. That's great. Anything else? Um, I tell you what, I'm particularly interested in also talking about OpenStack and um, how people's infrastructure looks, you know, whether it's on premise, um, you have stuff in the cloud or some combination thereof. Um, but I don't want to make this call just about things that are of particular interest to me and take up your time. Um, so if folks are interested in these things as, as well, um, we can um, you know, be great to stay on the call and keep, keep the conversation going. 
Um, but I don't want to keep people captive if people aren't really interested in these topics and, and um, keep you on the call as well. Um, so if, there's, uh, if there isn't any burning topics from, from folks, um, I can skip over to some of the, the business topics um, and get those covered um, and uh, let people uh, you know, escape um, if there's interest in that. Um, small group today. What do people, how do people feel? Hey, Nathan. <laughs> I, so I, I wish I had more to contribute to the discussion. You, you're probably aware of my background in this. It's a, I'm new to this group. I'm also effectively new to digital preservation work. Or I have a background as a Sambara developer and as a, a serials and e-resources librarian. And I'm kind of picking up from what Nathan left us here at the University of Cincinnati uh, <laughs> like over two years ago, uh, which is um, great work, but nothing has been done since then. So uh, kind of learning as I go. So uh, listening in on stuff is really valuable to me. So I'm trying to figure out really where to start with all of, all of this work. The one to hang on. I'm, I'm getting paid. <laughs> uh, well, let me just jump uh, for a second. Um, so our next call in, in August um, on the 19th, just a, a heads up, um, we're at a different time than normal. Um, so instead of our, our normal three o'clock um, Eastern time, um, that call is going to be at 12 p.m. Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific time. Um, we have some, uh, some international presenters, um, and that, that time just worked out a little better for everyone involved. Um, Nicholas uh, uh, Taylor is organizing that call um, from Stanford. Um, it'll be on international models for collaborative infrastructure. Um, we'll hear a bit about the Open Wayback. Um, project, uh, public knowledge project, does OJS, Open Monograph, um, and Sambera as well. Um, so that should be an interesting call. A um, uh, couple business um, items. Um, the DigiPres program was announced last week. Um, we do have our working lunch scheduled. Um, it's at a bit of a funny time. It's actually uh, before the plenary opening for DigiPres. Um, uh, so there's, there's, it's, it's DLF forum ends um, sort of after there's the half day Wednesday and, and uh, NDSA digital preservation sort of officially starts uh, the half day Wednesday, the latter half of Wednesday. Um, but um, the, that morning session, that morning of Wednesday, the last bit of DLF forum um, is, has some digital preservation um, topics um, and tracks built into it. So the attendees are, you know, are welcome and encouraged to attend if, if, you, if you get in. Um, so they put some of these, these working lunch um, groups in this sort of in-between time between here. So our working lunch is scheduled that first day, um, Wednesday at 1250. Um, the location is not there yet. So I guess we'll, we'll slide us in somewhere here before the actual start of the conference. Um, so that's our October meeting in place of a monthly call. Um, typically there, uh, we will sort of um, talk a bit about um, some things that went on in the year, how people felt about it. We'll go through some topics that um, people will want to talk about in the next year, try to find some folks who will help facilitate those, get some things lined up. Um, we will also have uh, a little presentation from the um, storage survey uh, working group um, with some sort of preliminary findings. Um, from, uh, from that survey. Um, it won't be, uh, the, the sort of report won't be ready yet for publication, um, but we'll have some uh, uh, sort of initial, initial results to present in the working lunch um, there. Um, 
another thing, um, and I'll bring this up at the next meeting too, um, was uh, to see if anyone would be uh, possibly be interested um, in the co-chairship, uh, so to speak, for, for this interest group. Um, uh, Corey Davis, uh, who is uh, currently my co-chair, um, he is going to be on sabbatical uh, for a, uh, from uh, six months starting in, in October. Um, I can't remember offhand, I, but I don't think he's going to be at DigiPrez, um, actually, because uh, it's right around the time he starts his sabbatical. Um, and we, we've talked about a, a, few, a few different ways it could go, but if anyone is possibly interested um, in being co-chair, um, let me know. Um, we can we can talk about that. Um, I'll talk about it probably at the, the next call as well. Um, it's a, the, the, having the facilitators on the monthly calls um, helps helps a lot with managing the group. Um, so there's the monthly calls here, and there's also um, at least one monthly call um, with the NDSA leadership group. Um, sometimes those get to be more frequent as well, um, and there's some. Uh, uh, strategy and governance things coming up at the NDSA as well that might be a little more uh, time consuming as well. Um, so if you're interested, let me let me know about that um, and we can chat more um, or offline. Um, okay, so did anyone think of any exciting infrastructure topics that they would like to talk about um, before we dive into OpenStack and uh, Anyone's free to to dive off the call if you are getting bored to tears, um, or just not interested in some of these topics um, as we get through them. Um, but anything else? Is anyone using OpenStack? Oh, Adardo, were you going to say something? Uh, yes, I would like to see in the <clears throat> USA if uh, there is a tendency to depend on cloud storage more than on uh, own infrastructure, uh, or people is trying to have his own infrastructure supported by cloud storage like Amazon. Uh, yeah, I'm curious about how it is going in the USA. I can speak for us um, at the University of Cincinnati. So we are we're a state institution. And as a state institution, it's been more challenging for us to get on board with cloud providers because there's a, a regulatory layer um, around signing contracts that has slowed down that process. I think that uh, the folks at Amazon aren't completely there. It's moving slowly with them as well as with us. and that's, Kind of stimmied adoption of cloud tools across the board. Um, also, there are additional um, accessibility guidelines that we're under more scrutiny for, uh, with people adding a, a sort of a layer of bureaucracy about making sure tools work with our general accessibility frameworks. You wouldn't think that this would apply to um, cloud storage, AWS or S3. But it, it does it does some work to slow things down. So we are primarily working on infrastructure that is vended out of our central IT unit and stored on local servers, with some other um, other infrastructure provided by state level uh, consortium, a, a statewide supercomputer center. So I think we're kind of starting to get on board with AWS, but. It's slow. We're doing it with pilot projects. Nobody has really sat down to figure out the pricing in terms of uh, what the lock-in looks like for getting data in and out, what storage looks like. Um, and that is partly, I think, just because we haven't had a lot of people paying attention to these issues much over the last few years. It might be me soon. Thank you. Yeah.
Eduardo, I can't speak for, for everything, but I, I think that there are trends toward the cloud. Um, uh, as, as James indicates, James indicates, I don't think it, it's universal, um, but I, I think in, in um, I think there are questions, you know, at Penn State, we were asked, um, you know, could we move to the cloud for, uh, for a new, uh, we're building a new digital collections um, application. Um, but when they realized the amount of content we were talking about, they, they were disinterested, um, you know, and, and pushing 200 terabytes to the cloud for, you know, the first project to try. Uh, um, so, you know, there, there's a little hesitancy when they realize just how much we're sitting on. Um, but I do think there are, are trends towards the cloud. Um, you might be, be interested. There's a, there, there, uh, we have a call, um, November, uh, no, September, um, on using the cloud for digital preservation case studies, um, uh, within this group. Um, that Matt Schultz will be facilitating. Um, Matt Schultz also leads a um, another group in NDSA that um, right now is in. It, it's kind of a subgroup um, uh, called the Cloud Studies Interest Group or Cloud Studies Working Group. It, it's it's kind of in a weird spot um, that also is taking a hard look at some of these. Um, you know, what does it mean and and uh, trying to get some useful information from mostly storage vendors right at this point right now. Um, and, and kind of, I guess, driving home at, at um, getting transparency um, in those sort of uh, vendor services, um, but doing some, some good work uh, as well. Um, and that one is, there, there isn't a presence on the NDSA website for that, but if you're on the NDSA all mailing list, um, Matt does send out emails about that group um, thank you. Yeah. Does anyone else have anything to, to add on, um, cloud, cloud infrastructure? It is, um, it's worth mentioning that AP trust operates entirely on AWS as far as I'm aware. So and that, that's easier for us to participate in because there's another proxy between us and AWS, so we're not contracting directly with Amazon. Some of these um, vendors, is, uh, cloud storage vendors, um, are also uh, able to uh, have a relationship with Internet 2, which in the U.S. is sort of a, a um, I guess they're a consortium, um, sort of like a, a consortium within higher ed um, that is able to uh, act sort of like a procurement group. Um, but uh, Amazon, Azure, and Wasabi are all um, available through Internet 2. And they negotiate um, uh, cheaper rates or other deals. Um, for example, through Amazon, I believe there's not only um, cheaper storage, but I think there's um, possibly no egress. Um, or um, so, if you if you're not an institution that is an Internet two institution, you can get get rates. So it might be. That's sort of adding to that context thing about where you are in your organization. It might make a difference if it's easier or harder, you know, to to move to the cloud. So does everyone have pretty much on-premises infrastructure then? Kind of like University of Georgia and I know Cincinnati does. Yeah, I can tell. 
I can speak for Columbia University. We still are on local storage. Uh, we're thinking of maybe switching to AWS at some point, but we are not there yet. At Harvard, we, our, our uh, compute infrastructure was moved to AWS uh, about two years ago, but we, we still have the, um, all of our preservation storage is right now is is on premises or at um, you, you know university uh, accessible co-location sites. Uh, yeah, I'll just throw in for CU Boulder. It, it's a mix of the two we've got on site with a, a group called Research Computing here that, that runs um, a media storage for the campus, just, just on campus. And we've been working with um, Archivum uh, out of the UK to, to move into uh, cloud-based storage that's more uh, geographically dispersed and, and so on. I don't know too many U.S. shops working with Archivum. All right. Yeah, yeah. I, I know Momo, I think, was their first U.S. Uh, client. Um, and they've got others. Um, but I think, yeah, the bulk of their clients are, are U.K.-based. So does that mean your copies are, are um, uh, not in the U.S.? If they're, if they're going through Archivum, or are they just a broker? You know, or does it not matter? Uh, no, it, no, it's a good, good question. It, um, they they subcontract with a couple of different cloud providers, um, AWS being one, and so it's on two different cloud infrastructures, and um, they also have a tape library operator that they work with in the UK. Um, so it's kind of that, that's the strategy, two, two cloud-based copies and then a, a tape copy. Um, yeah. You know, there's a US region in AWS? Yeah, well, in, with, in our, when we were working with them, yes, we did stipulate that there should be at a minimum one US-based cloud provider, um, but no doubt, data is being replicated outside the US, which we are okay with. I, I believe their, their uh, default service level is, is to rely upon two UK based uh, data centers, but, the, but as mentioned, they, they do have the facility to, to add um, other non UK based uh, cloud systems into the mix. Yeah, that, that's right. That that's that's uh, the sort of setup that we uh, worked out with them. But but yeah, I think they're by default they're they're UK based. Hmm. Does anyone else have a have a hybrid type infrastructure with some some on premises and some cloud infrastructure? We don't really have any in the library at Penn State, but I believe there are a couple. Um, there are a couple um, business applications that are totally hosted in the cloud, um, but it's it's not library data. Um, it's like the student information system, I think that they built recently is completely cloud based. And Um, my previous employer, um, I just started at Vassar July 1st, but the library company, who's an NDSA member, um, we had a combination. So we had local as well as we used Dropbox for preservation storage. The Dropbox model was really nice because it was in our budget. They offer unlimited storage. 
storage um, for a very reasonable price. And so we were using primarily the Bagot module of Island Dora um, to throw our archival TIFFs up into Dropbox. Um, but we were also putting copies of things that are on our shared drives that are also in a mirrored backup locally. I'm still learning what we're doing here at Vassar, so I can't speak to that at this point. <laughs> it's only been a couple weeks. No worries. Is anyone using OpenStack? Is anyone not familiar with OpenStack? I'm reading the Wikipedia page on it right now, so I think, I think I'm familiar now. Uh, yeah, I could use some background on OpenStack. Yeah, I think I, I heard about it before, but I'd never actually looked at it. Uh, when, when I was back at CDL, and, and I think they're, they're still doing this, uh, we weren't using it directly, but we, again, for um, one of our off-site preservation copies, we were making use of a private cloud operated down at uh, UC San Diego, and that, that was based on OpenStack uh, Swift. Um, OpenStack is uh well it started out at rack space i believe was sort of the the initiator and it, it grew quite a bit out of there um but openstack uh is a open source um sort of software to run a data center and the infrastructure that powers a data center um it's it's been around for for a, for a bit of a little while now is it probably at least 10 years um and it sort of started off as a, as a fairly core set of um, technologies and services to, to run your data center, you know, creating VMs, creating storage pools, um, and it has evolved uh, quite a bit. Um, it's been around long enough where it's matured quite a bit. Um, it, it, it's quite a varied ecosystem at this point. Um, I mean, it does containers, virtualization, Kubernetes, you know, spin ups, clusters. Um, it's actually being used. Um, actually, there are there are sub projects now of OpenStack. Um, AT and T is about to build their entire 5G network using a sub project of OpenStack um, called Airship um, to 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 build out their entire 5G network on the cheap. Um, kind of using the open source uh, technology here. Um, it, it's, I'm a fan of OpenStack um, and I'm trying to convince um, my library to, uh, to start using OpenStack for all of our infrastructure. Um, it has a sort of standardized Swift API um, that Steven just mentioned, which is similar to um, S3. Swift is their object storage um, API, there's um, objects go in buckets um, type of interactions. Um, and, and the Swift API is often like the S3 API. Other, other non-open stacked systems will, will sometimes support the Swift API um, to move data in and out. Um, I know Isilon supports the Swift API. Um, so it, it um, I think could be very powerful for, for running your own infrastructure. Um, and it makes it easy to leverage other open source technologies and to, to build off from them. Uh, for example, if you wanted to build a ZFS um, based uh, storage pool that uses Gluster to be able to replicate your data um, across zones, um, you know, in an automated fashion. So you didn't have to be writing scripts that were, you know, or, or processes that were automatic, you know, regularly checking and sending content over, right? The infrastructure itself these days can really handle a fair amount of the core preservation activities. 
Um, and I think OpenStack is a really interesting way to be doing some of those. Um, we're sort of in the habit of relying on our applications to handle a lot of the preservation activities because that's the way it was for so long because the, there weren't applications that did these things, so we had to build them out ourselves. Um, but the, the technology is, is there in the infrastructure now that in some cases, not every case, um, we can rely more on the infrastructure to make less complex monolithic applications that, that are more efficient and use less resources. Um, so I think it's really interesting. I'm just, just always curious um, if people are using um, OpenStack. It's just one. There are other ways to, to do these types of things too um, for, for preservation or in general for, for library collections. Um, So, so CDL, um, Stephen, you're saying one uh, uh, an organization that you can that CDL had contracted with to store one of the preservation copies um, used OpenStack to run that private cloud. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, UC San Diego Central IT. It, it's a it's a standard service offering that's certainly available to the UC system, and I think they may even have a separate price schedule for for uh, external people. Um, in uh, Canada, um, Scholars Portal, um, which is uh, something, it's, it's, a, it's a consortium that has been built by uh, the uh, OCL, uh, the Ontario, uh, Ontario Council of University Libraries. Um, they have built a private academic cloud using OpenStack um, for the universities within the uh, within Ontario. Um, I believe they have two different sites, two different data centers running OpenStack, um, and they use this to power the infrastructure for their libraries. Um, I think everyone pays a certain amount, and then for some things, I think it's included, and for other things, you you pay to use um, on top of. Um, but they use this for, for all of their core services that the consortium runs. They have a preservation service, they have a digital repository, they have a digital collections, they have an e-journal, they have an OJS. Um, they have quite, quite a bit of offerings um, through, through um, and Scholars Portal I think is just really one, one piece of that. Um, but I think that's, that's an interesting model. Um, that, that we should be doing more of in the US, frankly. But um, some of our international collaborators, I think are a little more innovative than, than some of the US institutions along these lines. Um, uh, Corey Davis, the co-chair here, um, I know he's built out um, a similar network to what Scholars Portal has done um, in Copal, um, where, where he is in the Council of Prairie, um, Council of Prairie, and there's another P in there, Council of Prairie and something University Libraries. Um, but I, I'm not sure it's, it's based in OpenStack um, or if it's, it's different underlying infrastructure for, for what they've done. Um, okay, well, if anyone wants to start an OpenStack cluster, let me know. See what we can do. Um, was there was there anything anything else anyone was interested to talk about um, infrastructure wise or NDSA wise um, before we before we end the call? We still have uh, 14 minutes or so here. All right, well, thank you everyone for joining the call. Um, I really appreciated it. I uh, really heard some interesting things today. Um, I wanna to look up a couple, a couple more in particular um, and uh, see how far those UC San Diego uh, offerings go. If you have to be in California possibly to take advantage of those. Thank you for mentioning that, Stephen. Um, but thank you very much. Um, everyone enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Um, I'll probably get the recording up here uh, by the end of the week, probably I should be able to do that. Um, 
usually doesn't take me too long to do a little bit of editing because it starts a bit earlier usually, so I have to chop off a bit and all that. Um, but uh, thank you and have a great day. I'll see you next month. Thanks, Nathan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.